Listener Production. Hello, Katrina Blau is here for The Briefing. Today is the day all non-prescription vapes are banned from being imported here as part of the government's continuing crackdown. Now, this comes after importing disposable vapes was banned on January 1. But could the crackdown force people to even more dangerous practices? It's pretty clear that on average, smoking is a lot worse for you than vaping. That's not to say that vaping is safe, but we just know that smoking is really bad for you. Yeah, that's coming up in the second half of the briefing. First, here are today's headlines. I'm joined by Antoinette Latouf. Pinch and a punch. It is Friday, the 1st of March. Hello, everyone. Hey, Katrina. The United Nations human rights chief, Volker Turk, has called for both Israel and Hamas to be investigated after claiming war crimes have been committed by both sides. Over the past five months of warfare, the office has recorded many incidents that may amount to war crimes by Israeli forces, as well as indications the launching by Palestinian armed groups of indiscriminate projectiles across southern Israel and as far as Tel Aviv also violate international humanitarian law, as does the continued holding of hostages. The current fighting began when Hamas militants attacked Israel in October, killing 1,200 people. Israeli forces have launched an offensive in Gaza where health officials say 30,000 people have been killed, mostly women and children, and after more than 140 days, there seems to be no appetite for the violence to stop. Yeah, and meanwhile, more than 100 people have been killed. Uh, We're hearing that they were waiting for food on the edge of Gaza City. Palestinian media citing medical sources who said that Israeli forces fired at the crowd, uh, but the Israeli military has blamed aid truck drivers, saying they drove into the crowd and the incident has nothing to do with them. Yeah, Katrina, every day when you just think things can't get more heartbreaking, there's a new revelation like this. It should also be noted that just a couple of days ago, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Michael Fackery, says denial of food is a war crime and constitutes a situation of genocide. This comes a couple of months after Human Rights Watch accused Israel of using starvation as a tool of war. You know, As we heard earlier, there have been war crimes committed by Hamas us on October 7, um, but what appears to be continual and ongoing acts of potential war crimes committed by the IDF. Russian President Vladimir Putin has again warned the West of the risk of nuclear war, this time if they send troops to fight in Ukraine. He made the statement during his State of the Nation address overnight, saying Russia has weapons that can hit Western targets and that Russia's modern nuclear arsenal is the biggest in the world. And his words seem to come in response to French President Emmanuel Macron, who floated the idea of NATO members sending ground troops to Ukraine. So this suggestion was actually quickly rejected by the United States, Germany, Britain, among others. Putin's speech comes ahead of Russia's presidential election in March, where he is certain to be re-elected for another six-year term because, you know, corruption and fixed elections. U.S. President Joe Biden's team says he is fit for duty after he underwent his annual physical exam. His doctor says the president is a healthy, active, robust 81-year-old. And this comes after Mitch McConnell, the longest serving US Senate leader in history, announced he will step down as Republican leader from November. Now, he is 82. McConnell has said he will continue to serve in the US Senate, but will allow the next generation of leadership to take the helm, suggesting he may retire at the end of his current term in 2027. Yeah, a lot of questions have been raised about whether McConnell is fit for office. Um, He's had a a few public appearances now where he appears to freeze while speaking. He's had a few um, documented falls, one of which he um, admitted to, you know, having suffered some concussion. And they've had a a, a few different neurologists now weigh in saying that what it looks like when he freezes in these press conferences is it looks like he's having seizures. Back to Biden and his continual defence of his age. I think we all forget when we focus on Biden and his age. And look, you know, he's not a spring chicken, let's face it. But neither is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is 77. And when you get to that 
sort of point where you're when you're in that age bracket, he's not that far behind Joe Biden. No, that's true. I think the difference is, even though I think that, you know, Donald Trump says all sorts of strange things that come out of his mouth, he believes them, he's coherent when he says them. Whereas in, there are so many instances in where Biden is not coherent, where his sentences don't make sense, where he trails off. And I just think between the two of them, in a country of 335 million people, Surely there have got to be some other contenders fit to run the country. Sydney's Mardi Gras parade is on tomorrow night. Football Australia and the Sydney Swans will be the only major sporting bodies to take part. So we've got the list. Um, Gymnastics New South Wales is also set to be involved, while a number of community sporting organisations are also participating, like the Wet Ones Swimming Club, great name, uh, Sydney Outfielders Softball League and Australian LGBT Ice Hockey. And amid all this talk about whether police should or shouldn't march, it's notable the NRL NRL is not taking part, Antoinette. Yeah, the NRL has previously been part of the parade, but their application was rejected last year, you may remember, after seven Sea Eagle players refused to play against the Roosters in July 2022 because of the club's Everyone in League initiative, and that involved rainbow piping on Manly's jersey. A Mardi Gras spokesperson wouldn't say if the Manly boycott had been a factor in the rejection of the float. Uh, but it did say at the time that organisers could only accept 70% of applicants due to demand. And Katrina, it's interesting to point out um, that, for example, the AFL has never had an openly gay player um, on their male team. Obviously, the WAFL does. Um, but in the NRL, uh, former NRL star Cooper Johns, um, who's, you know, long been retired, he's adamant that the league has plenty of gay and bisexual stars, but they just, you know, don't come out or don't feel that they can come out. And in soccer or football, however you prefer to refer to it, Josh Cavallo made history in October 2021, and he became the first openly gay male footballer in the top division. And wrapping up the headlines and now summer's done and dusted, early reports suggest it was, no surprise, our third hottest on record. It's set to be a warm autumn too, with the Weather Bureau expecting above average day and nighttime temperatures for most of the country. Uh, long range forecasters say that winter could be a wet season. So yeah, we'll have to see what is in store on this wild ride the climate is giving us right now. Antoinette, that is it for the headlines. Thank you for joining us. Up next, everything you need to know about the crackdown on vapes that kicks in today. And remember to tune back in at three for our Arvo briefing. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. On January 1, the government banned importing disposable vapes into the country. In theory, if you or your friends have bought a vape from a convenience store or a petrol station since then, that's from remaining stock and those stores should be running out. The next stage of the government's crackdown on vapes starts today, March 1st. From now, it's illegal to import any non-therapeutic vapes. That means rechargeable vapes and anything you could buy without a prescription, all of it. It's hoped that these changes will stop the spread and rise of nicotine addiction and respiratory problems, especially among kids and young people who've been vaping. But will this push more people back to smoking traditional analogue cigarettes? And will this be better or worse for everyone? Jamie Hartman-Boyce is Assistant Professor at the Department of Health Promotion and Policy at the University of Massachusetts. She's been involved in some of the highest quality international research into vaping and cigarettes, and she joins me now. Jamie, what's worse, smoking or vaping? When we look at all of the studies that have been done so far, it's pretty clear that on average, smoking is a lot worse for you than vaping. That's not to say that vaping is safe, but we just know that smoking is really bad for you. So on average, one in two people who regularly smoke throughout their lives will die from smoking. And by contrast, vaping is less harmful. What does vaping do in a harmful way to the body? We know a lot about how smoking affects the body, but how does vaping affect it? 
Yeah. So when you're vaping, you are inhaling a bunch of chemicals into your lungs. And generally, that's not a good idea, right? It's better to breathe fresh air if you can. And that's why everyone would say, if you don't smoke, don't start vaping. One of the complicated things when it comes to vaping and what it's doing to your body is that, of course, not all e-cigarettes are the same. So it'll really depend based on the type of device you're using, based on the kind of e-liquid, some of the flavors in there, what sort of chemicals might be entering your body. But we know that there are things in there that are harmful to the lungs, and that can cause short-term irritation, certainly. So things like cough, um, wheezing in some people. And then also there's evidence that it can go on and cause more serious health problems in the long term. But one of the issues with vaping is when we hear these really scary stories about the really serious harms that can be caused by e-cigarettes, mm. people who might, for example, end up in hospital, those tend to be from devices that aren't regulated. They're not coming from sources that we can trust. They tend to be things that might be being sold on the black market. They might contain things that are made to make them look like they contain THC, for example. And so we know those sort of additives, which really shouldn't be inhaled under any circumstances, can make it into illicit vaping products. When people do have really serious harms from vaping, do we know whether that is usually people who are vaping all the time? Or is it possible to have really serious harms, go to hospital, for example, from having a couple of puffs of a vape? That's a good question. I don't think we know that for sure. But when you look at patterns in the people who end up landing in hospital because of vaping, it's most often from devices that aren't from a trusted source. Mm. And one of the things that people were very aware of and very concerned about back in 2019 and early 2020 was an outbreak of really serious vaping related lung injuries that was happening, um, particularly in young people, but also in older people in the US uh, that was really causing some very life threatening situations. And they found in the end that that was due to an additive that was being put in e-liquid to make it look like the e-liquid contained more THC than it did, something called mm. vitamin E acetate. And so inhaling that is absolutely going to be really bad for your lungs, even if you're doing it in small quantities. It's banned from e-cigarettes in the European Union and always has been. So it really depends what's in that product. And mm. if you can't trust what's in the product you're vaping, it, it might not take very much for that product to make you really sick. Is the upshot from that that vaping given that it's much better for you than smoking, even though it's not good for you, that governments should be encouraging people to swap from smoking to vaping? That's certainly what some governments are doing. And I think there's a lot of things that go into the decisions governments make when they're thinking about that, right? One of them is how much of their population smokes. One of them is how well the government feels they're going to be able to regulate e-cigarettes and the tobacco industry's potential interference in that space. Certainly the evidence suggests that if you're someone who smokes, and particularly if you've tried quitting other ways and it hasn't worked, trying a nicotine e-cigarette from a source that you trust can help you quit smoking. The Australian government is banning the import of all non-prescription vapes from today. Just anecdotally, many of my friends were regular smokers before vapes became easily available basically everywhere. Now, many of my friends are regular vapors instead. I'm a bit worried that many of these people are going to go from vaping regularly back to smoking regularly. And as we've established, that might have some pretty serious health effects. Is that a reasonable thing to worry about? I'm worried about that too. Um, and I think lots of people are worried about that. You know, we know anything that's making someone return to smoking is not going to be good for their health. So for your friends or for anyone who's listening, who switched from smoking to vaping successfully and is now in a position where they're worried about not being able to access nicotine e-cigarettes, I would really, really highly encourage them to do everything they can to try not to go back to smoking and consider other things that might be able to help them deal with cravings. So for example, nicotine replacement therapies like gums or patches 
a note to anyone listening, those work best when you do both of them. So you have a patch on and then you're also using some sort of short acting form of nicotine, like a gum or a lozenge. Uh, and also to talk to healthcare professionals about ways that can help them stay quit or if they do go back to smoking ways that they can look at quitting smoking. If they've managed to totally successfully switch from smoking to vaping, then they've managed to successfully quit smoking once. And that is great news. And there's every reason to hope that they might be able to do that again. But absolutely, it's a concern. Is there such a thing as world's best practice for policy when it comes to vaping versus smoking? That's a totally subjective question, but I actually don't think so, because I think it depends on a number of things, right? There are some countries in the world which have managed amazingly and really successfully to have incredibly low rates of smoking. And for those countries, does it make sense to introduce e-cigarettes? Possibly not, right? The only way that e-cigarettes are going to be beneficial to population health is if they help people quit smoking, if no one's smoking, e-cigarettes aren't going to benefit them. But the reality is, unfortunately, in many countries in the world, smoking remains a leading, if not the leading cause of disease and death. It's a major cause of health inequalities between different groups of people in a lot of different countries. And for that reason, we see a lot of governments thinking about being open to encouraging people switching from smoking to vaping. Is this a bit similar to the decriminalization debate when it comes to illicit drugs in the sense that there's this argument that regulating illicit drugs would be more effective than prohibiting them. Should there be a highly regulated vape market where people can go and buy a vape and know what's in it, as opposed to it being banned? It's a really good question. One could definitely draw parallels between those two things, but you could also point out some really clear differences. You know, if we think about vaping in terms of harm reduction, there what we're thinking about is having a less harmful substance available to people who need it, which is slightly different from thinking about, for example, decriminalizing marijuana. Uh, so some similarities and some differences. What would be your message to someone who is a chronic vapor? and they find themselves wheezing, they've got respiratory issues, and they're worried about the impact on their health. What should they do? It's a really good question. There's studies going on at the moment looking into how to help people quit vaping, but most of them haven't been published yet. So we don't really know what the best thing to do is. We know there's some evidence that there are some text message-based programs that have helped people quit vaping. People are experimenting with things like uh, reducing the amount of nicotine gradually in what they're vaping so that they could eventually get down to not having any nicotine. And in the absence of good evidence on how to help people quit vaping, it makes sense to look at the evidence on what works in helping people quit smoking. And the good news there is that there are a lot of things that work. So you could try nicotine replacement therapies like patches or lozenges. Definitely recommend using both together to maximize the chances of success. You could look at using the prescription medications varenicline, cytosine, or bupropion, all of which have been shown to help people quit smoking. And then also we know that behavioral support, so counseling, quit line referral, things like that can also help. Should people be using this moment as a good excuse to try and quit vaping? I think absolutely, yeah. It would seem that... Um, they don't have many great other choices in that sense at the moment. And certainly the main thing that I would say is that they should do everything they can not to go back to smoking. Jamie Hartman Boyce there. So if you're vaping now and you're concerned about the impact on your health, go to the GP, get yourself a plan and her advice, whatever you do, do not pick up smoking. That's it for the briefing for this morning. Check back here at three for your afternoon briefing, where we'll be talking about why it is that social media platforms tend to start out well and then become shit over time. Speaking of, hit us up on Instagram, send us a DM at The Briefing Podcast if you've got any feedback or guest suggestions or story ideas, and I'll see you later. I'm Ben Sion Siebert. Thanks for listening. Listener.